Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our time of Wednesday night uh, Bible study and prayer time. And we invite you all to join together at 7 p.m. with uh, your loved ones or uh, by yourself, however uh, you can meet and bring the needs of the church, the needs of our community, and the needs of our nation uh, before our awesome Heavenly Father. And as we begin today, just as a reminder, we completed our study through the book of Zechariah last week. And today we're beginning a new study in the book of First Thessalonians. And so we look forward to the time that God has given to us that we will enjoy this portion of the New Testament. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you who have guided us in every way through your Son, Jesus Christ, have called us once more to your word and to prayer. And as we bring these things before you tonight, we remember that we do so because you're a God of grace and a God of mercy, a God of peace and a God of love. You're the one who has sent his only begotten son and through his death, through his resurrection, we now have life eternal. May we never forget the magnificent work that you have done on our behalf. May we never lose sight of just how amazing it is that we have been made right with you. And dear God, may we come before you in prayer tonight with the certainty and the assurance and the recognition that you are God and that we are your people. And we bear upon ourselves the very sign of your blessing. God, we lift up unto you today your church. We pray not only for the church here at Bethany, but dear God, we pray for your church in York County. We pray for every pulpit in our community that we all may preach Christ and him crucified, that we may all seek the commandments of the Lord in our daily lives, and that we might all be looking forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to God, we pray that you would protect, especially the ministers and leaders of the churches in our community, that each of us would be faithful in the calling that you have laid upon our hearts. And to God, we ask that you would open the hearts and minds of the lost in our county. We pray for the opportunities that you give us to proclaim your word, that we would do so boldly and that we would proclaim the whole counsel of God contained in the scriptures and would not concern ourselves with what men may think. For at the end of the day, dear God, we are not to tickle men's ears, uh, to tell them what they want to hear, but you have given unto your church a prophetic voice to proclaim God's word unto the world. God, we do so again, not for our own glory and not for our own purposes, but for yours, that your glory might be shown forth. And may that forever be the case. Dear God, we ask your blessings be upon our community as we continue to deal with all of the um, consequences of uh, this past year, uh, the virus, the lockdowns, everything that's involved, dear God, we lift up onto your hands. We pray for wisdom, we pray for clarity, and to God, most of all, we pray that you uh, would not forget your people in the midst of these things. For to God, we know that you have brought this time as a time of judgment upon uh, the church and upon our nation and upon the world. And to God, we ask that you would help us to see that, that we might repent of our sins, uh, both individually as a church, but most especially as a nation, Dear God, it seems as if we're doubling down on those sins. May you have mercy upon us. Dear God, may we be like the prodigal son who has uh, been eating at the trough with the pigs. And that may we return quickly unto our heavenly father. But dear God, if that is not your will, if your will is to bring destruction, we pray, dear God, that you would spare your people. That, dear God, we would be able to minister to those who are brought in to the midst of the destruction. That we might be able and willing to bring the broken 
into a right relationship with Christ. Dear God, we pray that you would be with your covenant people in the days ahead. Uh, continue to watch over our children, especially as they are facing so many difficulties in this age. We pray that we would be a light of Christ unto them, that we would not uh, fail in our duties to bring them the knowledge of Christ and the knowledge of your word. And dear God, as we come to 1 Thessalonians today, we pray that your hand would be upon our hearts, that you would give us more light and understanding. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now again, as I noted, we are going to be looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians over the next uh, several uh, months, however long in God's providence it takes us to get through this book. We both neither want to speed through it or forsake its uh, and, and, forsa and, and forsake its, its richness, or I should say, we also don't want to strip mine it and kind of take everything out and never get out. Uh, we're going to take our time, but we're going to do so judiciously. And as we begin today, let's go ahead and look at the opening verse. Uh, and we're just going to look at verse one uh, on this Wednesday. We, the first four words that we have in 1 Thessalonians are Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And this is enough in and of itself to take up our time. Paul, of course, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one converted on the road to Damascus, the one who used to be a murderer and destroyer of Christ's church, made now an ambassador of that same church. He is writing with Silvanus and Timothy. Now, who are Silvanus and Timothy? Silvanus is another way to say the name Silas. This is an important thing to remember. You know, sometimes people can get confused when the Bible uses different names for the same person, especially in the New Testament. But men like Silvanus and Paul, for that matter, both had what you would call formal names and informal names. They also had Greek names and Hebrew names. And this is partly because of the unique culture they were in. Paul, also called Saul. Silvanus, also called Silas. Now, when we hear that, we need to remember that Paul didn't uh, get his name changed by Jesus. Paul is his Greek name. It's the name he would have used out amongst the Greek-speaking peoples of the Mediterranean and even the Greek-speaking peoples of Judea. And Silvanus is no different. Silas, as he's known in the book of Acts, especially Acts 17, where we see Paul and Silas working together to take the gospel out unto the nations. And of course, Timothy, we know as the man who was Paul's closest confidant, his, his chief student, as, as it were. We know that he was pastor at Ephesus for a time. We also know that he was unique amongst all the disciples of Paul, that he was circumcised as an adult. Now, that doesn't mean he was an old man. It just means he was probably 20 or so years old. And Paul does that, as we're, we're told in the scriptures, in order that it would not be a stumbling block to the other Jews. Because, of course, Timothy had a unique backstory. Timothy was a son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And we hear in Paul's letter, uh, second letter to Timothy, that he had a faithful grandmother and mother who taught him the scriptures. And it's an encouragement, of course, to those of you who may or may not have uh, um, you know, a believing husband or a believing grandfather or, or whatever the case might be, that as a mother, as a grandmother, you still have the opportunity to have a outsized influence in the life of your grandchildren by teaching them about Jesus bringing them to worship and showing them the good news of Jesus Christ. We see the effect that it had in Timothy's life. So here in 1 Thessalonians, we have three names at the beginning of the letter. Now this is unusual. Uh, this is the only place this shows up in Paul's letters. In fact, when he writes the second letter to the Thessalonians, he again does so as well, mentions Paul, Silvanus, 
and Timothy. The uh, first two verses of 1 and 2 Thessalonians are ca carbon copies of one another. And this tells us something about the way that uh, Paul, or something about what Paul is doing in these letters. What is likely happening, the background of these letters, is unlike at Corinth, where he received a letter and he responds to them, as we hear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, here, Silvanus and Timothy, Silas and Timothy, are bringing some questions, some issues in the church at Thessalonica that Paul needs to answer. And we see this in how Paul writes this letter. And we'll get into that as we get into the meat of the scriptures. Now, we're told here again, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. So who are the church of the Thessalonians? Where did they come from? It's important again, as we uh, study God's words, know the background, know the context, know why this was written, who it was written to, that'll better help us to see Paul's point when he talks about certain subjects. Now, Thessalonica was a port city. It was a mixed city, if you want to use that kind of language. Uh, we first come in to the city at Thessalonica in the book of Acts, in Acts 17. Paul is said to come to that city to, and preach in the synagogues. Now, you know, it's worthwhile to go back to Acts 17 and kind of look and see what happened there. So we're told in Acts 17, verse 1, now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollo, uh, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, which, we're told, was Paul's custom. When he went into a city, he goes into the synagogue, and he teaches Christ to the Jews. Now, this is part, again, of the witness of Jesus. What does Jesus say to the Jew first and then to the Greek? So he goes to the Jews, he proclaims Christ, the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. And as he does so, what does he do? It says, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this is Jesus Christ, whom I preach to you. He is the Christ. Now, there's a lot of things that we're meant to learn here. First of all, we see the importance of regular attendance in Lord's Day worship. Now, obviously, the, the synagogue was meeting on the Jewish Sabbath, not the Christian Sabbath, but we also see something else about what ministers are to do in worship on the Sabbath day. As they preach, they are to present Christ. They are to show Christ and him crucified, and they are to call men to faith in Jesus Christ. This is what Paul does when he goes into the synagogue. It's what Jesus did when he went into the synagogue. When he goes into the synagogue at Nazareth, what does he do? And he preaches himself. He says, this day, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. He was telling the people at Nazareth that he was the Messiah, and Paul, again, does the same reason for them from the scriptures. So again, another thing that's important to remember, the preacher is to preach the Bible. He's to reason from the Bible. That is, he's not to use man's understanding of the world to explain the scriptures. Scripture interprets scripture. If we have any question about what the Bible means, well, then we need to ask the Bible because this is God's word. It's consistent with itself. From Genesis to Revelation, there is no contradiction in Holy Scripture. Now, if you have a part of the Bible that is hard to understand, well, you're supposed to go to an easier part of the Bible and then work back to it so that you better understand the hard parts and they're no longer the hard parts. That's kind of what Paul is doing at Thessalonica. So we're told something again about what happens at Thessalonica in Acts 17 after Paul reasons to them from the scriptures? We see that some of them are persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women, joined Paul in silence. So here we're told that the church at Thessalonica was mostly made up of devout Greeks. We're also told that the leading women 
joined the church. Now, leading women, what is that supposed to represent? Leading women would have been somebody like Lydia, right? Lydia, whom we learned about in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, is said to be uh, there a woman who was a seller of purple cloth. Now, that meant that she was wealthy. And so leading women here is meant to be women who are of an upper class. Now, that Paul is not kind of commending class uh, life or anything like that here. It's just a statement about who they are. They are leading women and also the devout Greeks make up the majority of the church at Thessalonica. However, something else happened at Thessalonica, we're told in Acts 17, that the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, we're told. And what did they do? Took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob. And what did they want the evil mob to do? Uh, they set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So here we have an instance of the gospel having its effect on men. And what I mean by that is that the gospel will always do one of two things. It will either convert the sinner or make the sinner angry. And when we think about that, that's fairly obvious because the gospel is all about repentance and faith. If a man loves his sin, he does not want to be told to cease from his sin. Right? That's a sign of unbelief. If a brother comes to you and challenges you on your sin, what's the Christian thing to do? The Christian thing to do is to reason from the scriptures, make sure that what you're engaged in is actually sin and you're to turn from that sin and unto righteousness. If you refuse godly counsel, that's a bad sign. That's a bad spiritual sign. It's a sign that you again love your sin more than you love Jesus Christ. Now those are hard words, but that's exactly what happens here at Thessalonica. And it's something that Paul's gonna deal with in this letter when he talks about the blessings that come with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're gonna to get to a couple of those here in a second as we finish up uh, verse one. But again, it's worthwhile to notice that they stir up the mob to go attack this man named Jason. Now, Jason is a Greek name. It's likely this is one of the devout men that are mentioned in the opening of the passage. And we're told that they go and they get Jason and they drag him out uh, of his house to the rulers of the city. Now, this sounds a lot like something that happened in the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, where the wicked men of Sodom came to try and drag uh, uh, righteous Lot out of his house and judge him and destroy him. This is not something that the Jews here in Thessalonica probably want to be associated with, but the comparison is pretty striking. And as they turn them out, uh, the rulers of the city cried out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here. Amen, right? Amen to the hundredth degree. This is what these men have done. They have turned upside down the world. And that's what the gospel should do, right? It should have an effect on men. And if you claim to be a believer, if you claim to be a Christian, but it has no effect in your life, then that's a testimony in and of itself. Has your faith turned upside down the world? Well, if it hasn't, you need to be asking some questions. And again, we can't have a church that's based on flimsy testimonies, especially in the world in which we're living now. Men are going and already are going to have to give an account for the hope that lies within them. And they're going to have to be willing to face the judgment of the world. And they're going to have to ask themselves, would they rather be pulled out of their house and judged by wicked men, stoned to death in the case of Stephen, or would they rather live peaceful lives? Now, that may not happen in Clover, South Carolina in the next week and a half, but that's already happening, happening to our brothers and sisters around the world. And they're choosing that it's better to be laughed at and mocked and derided by unbelievers because what do they have? They have Christ. 
And Christ is better and greater than anything that we can imagine. And so we hear all of these things and again, the Holy Spirit intervenes and in verse eight, it tells us, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So they had taken screw from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So again, you know, we see the Holy Spirit protect Jason. Now that's always gonna be the case, but that does happen at Thessalonica. So again, that gives us a little bit of foundation background here to what Paul is writing to the church. Now, after we see Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, Paul, Silas, and Timothy reference, the next thing that we're, we hear is to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here repeats himself. He mentions God the Father twice, and he mentions the Lord Jesus Christ twice. Now, whenever the Bible mentions something more than once, what is that supposed to tell us? That we need to pay attention to it. And it's something that's especially important for the church of Thessalonica to hear, as we've already heard. The, the, the Greeks in the city, uh, or the Greeks in the church, I should say, need to be reminded that Jesus Christ is not the only God. In other words, that the gospel is not about Jesus alone. It's about the reconciliation of fallen man with the triune God, with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is important, again, for us to hear. Our faith can become, you know, to use a big fancy word, Christonomic. That is, a, 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 you know, Christ alone is all we talk about. And of course, Christ is central and he's important. But again, we don't believe in Christ being the, the be all and end all of everything. We believe the triune God is, right? When our catechism says, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. We know that that God has a definition, that he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Paul here is helping the church at Thessalonica to remember this great gift. Right? There's a deepness and a richness to remembering that our God is triune that we believe in a trinity and that there are blessings that we receive from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see something else about the titles that are used around the name Jesus. He is both Lord and Christ. And this goes back to something that we see in the book of Acts uh, when, you know, when uh, the, the apostle Peter is preaching. What does he say about Jesus there? As he is reasoning from the scriptures with the Jews, right? this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself, he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is who Jesus is. He's not the son of Joseph. He is a son of Joseph, but he's not, that's not his primary identification. He is the Lord Christ. He is the king of kings, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the redeemer. All of these things, again, are tied into these titles of Lord and Christ, that he is the Messiah, the living one. And he is God incarnate. He is God. Amen. And Paul here, again, is explaining this to the church of Thessalonica so that they don't forget and fall into the traps that have been laid both by the Judaizers and by the Gnostics. And we'll explain those two terms a little bit more as we continue in our time in the book of First Thessalonians. But another, to kind of close our, our, our time today in this opening verse, the, we need to step back a little bit and look at those two words, grace to you and peace. Now, those are pretty common words that Paul uses especially in his openings 
in his letters. And we need to make sure that we don't skip over grace and peace. For those are the uh, kind of the fullness of the gospel for us, right? We think of grace, right? Undeserved, the undeserved gift of Jesus for our sins. We think of the grace, the application of the righteousness of Christ to our souls, our being born again, born from above, our get being given this new life in Jesus Christ. Right? That's what grace is all about. It's the foundation of everything that we are. Because again, God did not have to save us. But God, out of love for his fallen creation, out of love for his elect, out of love for the sheep of Christ's uh, you know, flock, has raised us and given us all that we need. And as we think upon that, we cannot lose sight Again, as I said in the prayer, the, just the magnificence of this, the, the enormity of what has been done for us in Jesus Christ. And that's what always leads Christians into darkness, into sin, and eventually into apostasy, is we forget what the gospel means. We forget that we do not deserve these things. We're unworthy, but Christ died for the ungodly. Having received these things, how should we respond? Well, that's where peace comes in. When we look at the gospel, it has to have an effect on our life. As I already said, if it has no effect on our life, then we're not saved. If there is no fruit, then there is no life. Remember, what does Jesus do with the fig tree that had no fruit on it? He curses it and it dies. We cannot claim the name of Christ and live like a pagan. We cannot claim the name of Christ and have no desire to worship him. We can't claim the name of Christ and have no desire that others would know what we have in Jesus Christ. Because again, it's a sign that we don't actually have any of that within us. There's no question that it does us no good to know that Jesus is Lord and him not be our Lord. Think of what James will say in his letter. Even the demons know that Jesus is the Christ. Even the demons know that Jesus is God. Who is the first created being outside of John the Baptist? During Jesus' earthly ministry, who's the first one to recognize that he's the Christ? It's a demon, isn't it? And it's not enough for us to mouth words. It has to come from the heart. and It has to have an effect on our soul. And this is why, again, Paul follows grace with peace. It's not just a fanciful way to start his letter. But in these two words, we have the whole breadth of the effect of the preaching of Christ. Peace, you know, of course, comes from uh, the Hebrew word shalom. And we're meant to understand that peace is not just the cessation of hostilities, but peace is a reference to the wholeness of what we have in Christ. Now think about that for a moment. When we think of the spiritual blessings that come with grace, we think about the, uh, the, the fixing of the problem. The problem we have is that we are sinners and we fall short of God's glory and that we are missing something. We're missing God. And so having this new life given to us in Jesus Christ means that the hole in our soul has been filled. And so peace is a reference to this. It's a reference to the fully orbed gift that has come to us in Jesus Christ. Now, Again, when we think some more about this, when we think about what peace has been brought to us, right? It's the removal of sin. It's the removal of iniquity. It's the removal of idolatry. It's the removal of all of these evil things. When you have an infection in your body, what has to happen? It's not enough just to put good things in your body, right? The infection has to be removed. When you're dealing with somebody who has uh, dead tissue, 
right? The dead tissue has to be cut out in order for living tissue to grow in its place. And that's the same with the gospel. Again, the gospel has to do something for us. And we have to show that it's doing something for us. To love Jesus Christ means to hate sin. To love Jesus Christ means to put sin away. To love Jesus means not just to believe in him, but to live in him. And we'll get into more of what that means in the book of 1 Thessalonians. But again, this has kind of opened our time. And again, I look forward to the opportunity to speak more about the blessings of this book as we see how Paul ministers to this church at Thessalonica. Again, we invite you to join together for prayer tonight. And we look forward again to this study of 1 Thessalonians. May the Lord keep you and guide you and may he continue to bless you in every way through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take care.